Um, you know, I, I know we had talked, said that it was going to be lens technology. Really, it's the conversation that um, you should be having with your optician and the kind of things that you should be aware of um, when purchasing a pair of eyewear. So what we're going to talk about is, is how our vision's changed. Um, one thing that Patricia had talked about was, um, you know, online retail versus uh, big box retailer versus independent retailer. Uh, as a lens consultant, I can tell you that the independent retailers, um, like Gavin Herbert downstairs, the optical shop, have a far greater range of products for you to meet your needs than a retailer or than online. The business models of those are set to be a lot more simple, be a lot more straightforward. There's a lot more consultation that goes on in an independent um, optical shop, in an independent eye care provider. So this is um, something that's food for thought and this is something that we should all know. And this is our modern, um, it's called a Snelling chart. And this, everybody's you know, taking this eye test, right? Can you see 2020, you cover one eye, you read it. What you may not know is that this was created um, around 1860. So what I'm trying to tell you is the modern test that we're using to test how well you can see, it's pretty old. Here's a few other things that were created around 1860. You know, um, telegraph, phonograph, uh, some people still do have this egg beater. But a lot of these things have been modernized. And the reason it's important is because we, we don't live our lives in the 1860s anymore. We live in 2019. So when we talk about 2020, and this is something that we should all know, is 2020 means that you can see 20 feet what the majority of people can see. And what that means, and the reason that's important, is because 20 feet is, is optical infinity, that's where light parallels. What it means to us is that's where one object becomes clear at a distance. So what that means to you is when your doctor provides you with a prescription and it is for distance, guess how far it's for? 20 feet. So I don't know about you all, but I definitely don't use that 20 feet very often. There's some activities that I use it for but past that, there's not a whole lot of time in our modern world, in, in my life, in your lives, that we're using 20 feet vision. So the reason it's important is because there's a lot of things changing with our vision. There's a lot of things that are going on that are a lot closer than 20 feet. Um, you know, time and time again, I'll work with a patient who's got a pair of prescription glasses that are for distance only, and they're complaining about irritated eyes, or itchy eyes, or tired eyes. Well, the problem is that they're using a prescription that's designed for 20 feet, but maybe they're looking at a 10-foot focal point. Maybe they're looking at a 4-foot focal point. Or in the case of a cell phone, they're looking at a 2-foot focal point. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot more of the use of these devices. And the more and more we're seeing the use of these devices, the more kinds of difficulty they're causing for our vision. So the first one is the distance portion. Again. 20 feet viewing distance is what your prescription's written to. If you're focusing, you know, two feet, four feet, five feet, you're causing what we call over accommodation, and that's putting, causing the muscles in your eye to overwork, and that's where your strain is coming from. Um, here's a little bit to know about how much we spend um, our personal lives and our days using media. You know, me media has become a very, very, very impactful, um, you know, just impactful for our vision. You know, we spend tons of time viewing media. Um, there are some adverse effects there. So myopia, um, kind of a big word. If you guys have never heard it, it means farsightedness. Uh, I'm sorry, it means nearsightedness. Sorry, <laughs> vice versa. When, when we say myopia, we mean nearsighted. That means you can always see things that are close to you. These are increasing cases of myopia, and we're seeing a lot more increasing cases of myopia globally. Um, Theoretically, the reason we're seeing it is because more and more people are spending time focusing much, much closer, and primarily your prescription is designed for a distance. So what we're seeing is a higher and a higher need for a pair of glasses to help us see far away. And that's because we're focusing our lives more and more at our arm's length at what's close to us. So aside from myopia, there's a few other things that can become uh, problematic when we're using a pair of um, prescription glasses. So ergonomics is huge. And this is really for a lot of you folks who've ever worn a, a progressive lens or a no-line bifocal. You may notice that it doesn't work 
quite where you want it to, and you've got to find a good way to use it to where you're comfortable. The second thing that becomes an obstacle is getting your posture to a comfortable point so your neck doesn't hurt, so your shoulders don't hurt. And this has to do with, with how we've created a lens and how we've designed the lens from the manufacturer's standpoint. So essentially, this is what your perfect posture should be. Um, I don't know a whole lot of people who manage this in their day to day, but if you would manage to keep your posture like this, and the biggest thing that I can point out here for those of you who have used an, um, no line bifocal or progressive lenses, see how his monitor is slightly lower than his eye line? It's not directly ahead of it. Well, that's because that lens is designed to work at that 20 feet on the top, but then the power starts shifting as they go underneath. So again, if, if you are wearing that no line bifocal, that progressive lens, and you're finding that it's difficult to use a computer, uh, remember that the top of it is designed for 20 feet. So two things you can do is one, push it farther back away from you, or two, push it lower down. So you're using a lower portion of that lens because that's where the power starts to change to see things closer. So these are some of the, some of the symptoms that we see um, as far as fatigue from digital eye strain, tired eyes, headaches, eye strain, um, neck and back pain. Any of these things can you know, be a result of either incorrect posture or wearing a pair of glasses that's too strong for that given focal point. The other thing that we're starting to see now is increasing cases of dry eye as well. So Patricia had mentioned it, um, and it's something that we see commonly, and um, we're, we're noticing a lot more and more. One thing that you may not know is your blink rates slow dramatically when you're looking at a digital screen. So a, a factor could be that. An additional factor is people wear contact lenses way too frequently, causing a lot of dry eyes. And then finally, the climate that we live in. Um, Southern California is pretty much a natural desert. So all, all these things can have a factor. And what we see is we see a lot more increasing cases of dry eye globally. This is the US versus the rest of the country. And, and you notice that the US is dramatically higher. I'm not sure the difference between the female and the male demographic, but as you start to um, go towards countries that have a lot more usage of digital media, you're gonna start to see a lot more cases of dry eye. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, many of you have heard about blue light. Yes, no, maybe, mm -hmm. sometimes. This is one of the biggest buzzes um, currently in the media and in our industry as optics is what is blue light? Is it doing anything to me? Um, is it bad? Is it good? So what I want to let you know, and the biggest thing that you want to know, is that blue light is all around us. Um, you know, bright sunny day, you go outside, what color is the sky? Blue. The reason the sky is blue is because light scatters in the atmosphere. The strongest wavelength is blue. The strongest wavelength can also be detrimental to us because as it starts to get past that blue into the violet, it becomes ultraviolet. Um, everybody's seen a, the purple ultraviolet lights? So when you get to ultraviolet, it, it's no longer a blue light, it's ultraviolet. What you see here on this side is some of the things that um, you may have heard about when it comes to blue light. So the first one is um, memory loss, or it's harder to learn, or um, neurotoxins. What these have to do with, and, and stick with me here, blue light is both beneficial and detrimental. So what these have to do with is using um, devices that emit blue light later in the day. So what blue light does for a person is it regulates your circadian rhythm. When you wake up first thing in the morning, if we were all cave people and we didn't you know, live in homes with digital devices, the first thing we see when we get up in the morning is that blue light. That blue light affects our body, tells us it's time to be awake, and immediately suppresses our production of melatonin. What we're doing at night when we're using digital devices is we're artificially suppressing our production of melatonin. Uh, many of you, you know, know somebody who takes melatonin to go to sleep at night. And it's a natural cycle that we have. So if you stick with that natural cycle, right, you wake up in the morning, the blue light hits your eyes, it suppresses the production of melatonin, you're awake. Around 7 p.m., the sun goes down, no more blue light, your body starts producing melatonin. You eventually fall asleep around 9 p.m. If you're artificially adding that blue light, it can keep you up. Um, that's where we're talking about causing obesity risks, depression, neurotoxin, harder to learn, and that's because people aren't getting adequate sleep because of their digital media usage. The secondary thing we hear 
is it causes retinal problems um, and potentially cataracts. We know for a fact that overexposure to large amount of light does um, cause more early onsets of cataracts. Now, age-related macular degeneration or retinal issues are common um, and they can happen with exposure to sunlight. The risk here is that on top of the exposure to sunlight, on top of the standard exposure to light that you may have, while well, you're also putting an artificial source. So we're, you know, as professionals, um, as lens professionals, we're not saying that the digital device is gonna cause the macular degeneration. We're saying it's an additional factor that's adding additional unwanted blue light to your eye and that can cause an earlier onset of these problems. So we wanna be aware of that and we wanna make sure that we're you know, doing the right kinds of things to, um, to help ourselves. And one thing that we've noticed is we've seen a, an increase of age-related macular degeneration. We're seeing it more and more and more frequently. Now, it, it is a little bit of a slippery slope, but remember, if we take a child who was born in the digital age and we look at that child's development, um, we can only have that child up until maybe age 18 now. You know, we don't know what the effects are gonna be once that child becomes 30, 35, 40, because they just haven't got there yet. But we do know that if we take adults um, who have continuously come into this digital age, we're seeing them with increasingly larger cases of macular degeneration in their lives. So the reason this happens is because blue light, this guy's blue light, actually passes through the lens. That's the lens of your eye. That part actually is what the cataract is. So once that becomes old, it turns into a cataract. The blue light will actually pass all the way through and fall onto the retina. And that's where it starts to cause problems and starts to cause deterioration. Um, and like I said, it's not just those digital devices that's causing a problem, it's the additional source of them that's causing more problems. So we want to make sure we're aware of these things. We're, we're talking to our, you know, our opticians and our eye care professionals about different ways that we can prevent this from getting to the back of our eye so we can protect our vision for much longer especially in the cases where we have retinal issues, hypertension, different um, high blood pressure, different issues that are gonna cause problems with your retina. Finally, um, the additional thing we have is computer vision syndrome. So we're getting dry eyes, we're getting larger and larger cases of myopia, we're getting people suffering from macular degeneration, and also we're starting to see a lot of things happen when it comes to computer vision syndrome eye inflammation, obesity, lower back pain, pain in your knees, cervical, temples, all of these are related to different things. Some of them are related to the blue light keeping you awake much longer. Some of them are related to how we're sitting when we're using those computers. Um, and some of them are just related to using the wrong type of correction as far as the actual focal point. So it's, it's important to note that if you are using a desktop computer or using a lot of media, when you get a pair of glasses, it's probably pretty crucial that you let your provider know that you're spending a significant portion of time at that focal point, because again, the focal point is 20 feet. So, this is written a little bit more for an eye care provider, but um, we'll kind of change the wording to fit a little bit better. We wanna make sure that when we're shopping for our glasses, when we're working with our providers, that we're making sure that we're educated on our long-term eye health. Like I said, the macular generation, the blue light, the overexposure to these devices is not necessarily new, but it's additional exposure that we never had before. Secondarily, we wanna make sure we're protecting ourselves for multiple different things. Um, I've asked providers and every provider I work with to make sure that they inform their patients. They write them a distance full-time prescription. They write them a pair of uh, prescription for sunglasses. And finally, an occupational or a computer prescription, because a lot of times what we're doing for our occupation is not gonna be that full length distance. And, and finally, we wanna make sure we're, we're having those conversations with our eye care providers so we're getting the best solution for our visual needs. Um, it's very easy to you know, see the eye doctor, have a prescription, and go get that filled, but those numbers you know, should also go along with a consultation from a professional who's gonna help you fill them the right way.
So yes, it can be a progressive lens. So when we talk about a distance full-time, a sun and a computer occupational, the reason that's important is because if you do your progressive lens, right, and you have your 20 feet out there, you're gonna have 20 to near. Well, that progressive lens with your 20 feet is not gonna be the most optimal solution for potential occupation or for a desktop. So what the provider would do at that point is they would decrease that prescription so that the top portion was more around five feet for a desktop or potentially you have um, some type of an occupation where you're working much closer. So the, the designs are designed based on performance areas. So yeah, it is more question into the patient. Um, basically, I were to consult with you and find out that your highest level of value in your vision is your reading area. Well, I would focus on a lens that gives you a better portion there versus in the distance area. Yeah, so if you got them downstairs, they're transitions, or they should be. Um, <laughs> but the, a transitions lens, uh, transitions brand, len brand lens is 100% UVA and UVB. So once it's fully activated, it'll, it'll be UVA and UVB. It's totally up to you. I mean, it has to do with convenience. If you had the progressive lens, you wouldn't be switching glasses. You would just be wearing one the entire time. So, so we're, talki we're talking about separate things. So when I talk about um, a pair of sun lenses and I talk about um, reduces blinding glare, what we're talking about there is glare coming off of objects. When we put a no glare coating on your lens, what we're doing is we're putting a coating to prevent from light reflecting off the surface of the lens itself. So if you take a look at your lenses and they look like they have a little bit of coloration to them, either a blue or a rainbowy or a green, then those have a no glare. Just like any, um, you know, any optical lenses we see in binoculars and rifle scopes and telescopes and microscopes, they all have that rainbow effect to them. That's there to reduce the glare on the surface of the lens. However, a polarized sun lens is there to reduce glare coming off of objects. It does make your vision better. Yeah, so it, it makes you look better and it does make your vision better. So um, the biggest thing to keep in mind when it comes to that is that when the doctor examines you, the ferropter they're using also has a no glare coating on it. So when we remove the no glare, we're actually reducing your visual acuity um, anywhere from like five to 10% depending on the material. So by having glare on the lens, light isn't able to penetrate the lens as well and it does affect your visual acuity. You would want to bring them back. If you got them here, we can take a look at them. Um, potentially, it has to do with the prescription itself or with, with what we're comparing them to. A lot of times when we have multiple sets of lenses, we end up having um, different designs put in them depending on if we got them from different providers, and that can have an effect on it as well. So polarization is basically, um, it's a set of laminates lined up like a Venetian blind straight across on 180, and it prevents from reflections coming off the top and coming from below. Um, there is a brand of lens which is called a driveware, and essentially it is a light um, olive color polarized, which will allow you to see better in the car, and it does get slightly activated with sunlight to get a little bit darker when it gets brighter. So that's the best option for a, a driving pair of polarized lenses. But all polarized lenses are gonna give you some kind of Vision issues, some people are more sensitive than others when it comes to LED screens, mm -hmm. gas pumps, looking through the glass windows of your car. Mm -hmm. um, it looks really it, weird on my phone. Yeah. It looks really so, weird on your phone. So one thing you can do is turn your phone sideways um, because again, a polarized lens is preventing light from um, that 180 horizon either directly below or directly above. That's exactly what an LED is on a gas pump. It's light directly below or below, so you're effectively blocking it right out. If you turn it sideways, it, yeah, it'll work. It's, it's kind of a trick question. You want to make sure that you're covering the sun as much as you can. Um, the darker lens would probably help you out better going towards it just because it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a little bit better. But don't, don't look at the sun. Like, cut, cut, <laughs> cut the sun out. What was your question in the back, sir?
You can go to the person writing your prescription. Um, the the optician won't be able to make won't be able to change it. Um, That's not true. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's 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 some there's some tricks involved there. So if your doctor is providing you with a prescription that is a bifocal prescription, uh -huh. the optician can manipulate it for different distances based off what's given there. Um, however, if you want to make sure you're getting the proper focal point distances, you want to make sure you're letting the provider know. Because a lot of times what they'll do is they'll ask you specifically, how far is your workstation? And they'll measure your, your visual acuity to that exact distance. I can tell you right now, I've been a consultant for doctor's offices for a couple of years now. And one of the things that most optometrists tell me is that their patients don't give them enough information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They don't ask questions. They want you to ask questions. Don't feel afraid of not being able to tell them, doctor, this is what I do on a normal day. I do this type of activity, I do this in the evening, and this, this activity is most important to me. Let them know because they can adjust your prescription. They love to hear that. It's their biggest frustration is, man, I just can't get them to tell me what they do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, writing one prescription, two prescription for a different focal length, different activity, that doesn't cost you any more. You know, it, but it gives them an idea of what it is that they can do for you. Yeah. And it makes the optician's job a little easier because we do the same thing. We'll take their prescription and we'll ask you a whole bunch of questions. Doesn't mean that we can't go back to the doctor and say, you know, doctor, you know, Dr. or Mr. Smith here, he plays golf every weekend. Well, there's certain types of progressive lens or certain type of bifocal lenses that I would prescribe for a golfer that I wouldn't just for anybody who just does normal work. There's specialty lenses that we're educated in, in offering as well as the doctors. So ask questions. That's, and, that's and the make most sure you, important thing. And make sure you set an expectation too and, and let us, you know, let us know as the opticians, you know, what your day to day is let the doctor know. And remember, um, one thing that I've heard from many optometrists is that there's no right or wrong answers in the eye exam. We, we need to know what's best for you. It's not a, you know, it's not a finite thing. So you always want to keep that in mind. Okay, you guys. Well, thank you for joining us. If you have any...